I can understand how some of you might, you know, particularly those of you who know me really well, might be a little concerned having seen the title that I gave for today's message. Now, that title is simply Father's Day. This might seem an odd choice for me, a little out of character, maybe. Like, I've decided to be, for this sermon, probably a little more serious or focused than usual. And it's in that mindset that I want to open with this quote from the Wikipedia entry about Father's Day. And it says, Father's Day is the eighth episode of the first series of the British science fiction television show, Doctor Who. <laughs> Come on, you, did you really think I'd missed the perfect setup for one more obscure sci-fi joke? Uh, if you thought that, you just don't know me. Of course, now I've gone full meta here, since the setup and delivery of that joke can perhaps charitably be described as peak dad joke. You know, at 35 years old, with three kids running around, or at the moment, thank God, sleeping peacefully, I feel like I've really started to live in to this identity as a father. And I was lucky enough growing up to have a pretty good father myself, you know, the sort of guy who I can look back fondly on every 15 or 20 minutes when, as a parent, I realize I haven't the slightest clue what I'm doing. And when I look back on my father and how he raised me, my one takeaway is this. Everything you do for your kids must come from a place of love. You protect them, you care for them, and you keep them safe. Everything is about giving them the best you have to give. Always. Which, I have to admit, is why I tend to have a real problem with identifying God as a father. I mean, I understand why we do, of course. It's, it's a convenient enough analogy. Fathers love us while still being bigger and more powerful than us. Fathers excuse just a host of really stupid behavior in exchange for gentle guidance as we grow and we learn and mature. And, you know, I guess God kind of does the same. I guess. Look, as a father, my goal is to make sure that my kids are safe and that they can be healthy and happy and build good lives in God's service but when I look at what happened today, particularly in the Genesis reading, I'm not so sure that God's goals are the same as mine. Let's take a look at what really happens here in the text. So we start with Abraham, you know, Father Abraham, as the children's song goes, looking upon the mother of his firstborn son and that exact same son, and he just decides to cast them out into the wilderness to appease his jealous wife. And, by the way, remember that casting someone out into the wilderness in those days, that was a death sentence. Abraham and his company, they were, they were nomads. They roamed in between those distant ancient city-states. It's not like Hagar and Ishmael could just walk over to the nearest Best Western, snag that continental breakfast, and start looking for work. They were in the middle of nowhere. To be cast out from their tribe, sent away from the people they were with, that was a death death sentence. So we've already opened with Father Abraham pronouncing an effective death sentence on his firstborn. Not exactly the greatest track record for biblical fatherhood so far. But then God comes along. And by this point in the story, when he comes in, Ishmael is on his last legs. They're out of water. There's no food really forthcoming. And it seems that death is inevitable. I mean, it's so obvious that this is what's going to happen that Hagar actually lays her son under a bush and just walks away because she knows what's going to happen and she can't bear to watch. And that's the moment here. Enter God the Father. I remember reading this and feeling really expectant. I mean, this, this is where we're going to see the real example of fatherhood. The single mother and her son in need of love and care and protection. And God arrives and not much changes. 
I mean, God brings forth a bit of water for the two of them, so dehydration is off the table, all right. But there's nothing more than that. No mana from heaven, no divinely crafted house in the woods. God doesn't cause a fully staffed Dunkin' Donuts to spring forth entire from the earth. Just a bit of water. And you're on your own. What the heck kind of father is that? I mean, just as a normal human father, I can think of a handful of better things I could do for mom and baby than just a bit water than be on your way. Now, where's the fatherly wisdom? Where's the fatherly protection? Where is that fatherly love? All right, well, maybe God's fathering style is a bit more hands-off, right? Now, well, we look at the passage in Matthew then, and we get even more conflicting and confusing information. Our God the Father here seems really weird. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs on your head are all counted. <laughs> Look, I am a parent of only three kids, and I have to be honest, I do not know how many hairs are on my kids' heads. Any of them. I mean, some days I roll out of bed in the mornings, and if I happen to trip over one of my sons before I get some coffee in me, I may be surprised to discover if they have hair in the first place. You know, and I bet if I were to look under their beds, I might actually find a sparrow who fell to the ground without my knowledge. It would actually probably be only about the third most insane thing to be surprised by under their beds in a given day anyway. Look, I, I absolutely do watch my kids like a hog. I'm as attentive a parent as anyone else, I think. And you can bet your backside that not a day goes by that I'm not making 100% sure that I know where my kids are and, at least in a general sense, what they're doing. But I'm not on them 24-7 like this. As a parent, it's kind of insane. I mean, no father in their right mind would be that controlling of their kids. They'd grow up with a complete inability to trust me if I did that. <clears throat> So once again, God the Father here really doesn't sound like much of a dad. You know, a few weeks ago, I was putting together this big green screen setup that I use to record all the various church things that I've been doing, and I got stuck trying to build the frame assembly. And I had this one piece that I was absolutely convinced I needed to use because it was definitely, clearly, obviously part of the frame. It was this little clip thing with a hole on one end and I just, <clears throat> I spent the better part of an hour trying to figure out where in this crazy framework this one piece was supposed to fit. I mean, I tried to put it on the end of the poles and I tried to connect it to the base and I just kept looking and looking, trying to figure out how this thing, which was clearly part of the frame assembly, how it fit. But after a while, I just reached a point where I had to give up. I couldn't figure out where this piece of the frame assembly went. So I set it aside and I started building without it. And after a little while, I got the whole entire framework put together, set up completely. The green screen was hanging and there's still just this one piece sitting off to the side doing nothing. And in that moment, I realized that this piece wasn't part of the frame assembly at all. It was part of one of my kids' toys, which just happened to look like it belonged with all the other parts. Of course, in all the time that I had spent obsessing over how and where this piece had to fit with the frame that it absolutely did not fit in, I had inadvertently learned how all of the other pieces fit together too. And once I set this not really a piece aside, I was able to get on with the work of assembling the frame a lot more quickly than I would have been if I hadn't spent all this time obsessing over this one not really a piece. I think our understanding of God as a father is kind of like this child's toy that has sneaked into our framework pieces. It looks like it belongs, and it's easy to think that it does at first glance. But when you start trying to make it fit, you realize there isn't really a place for it here. It just doesn't connect. Because the truth of it is, God isn't a father. God is much, much more than that. God is God. 
Now, our understanding of God as a father has been in some ways helpful. It's been a framework over centuries of church doctrine and practice. Thinking of God as Father has been, for some of us, very helpful indeed. It's been a way to help us perceive God's authority as above us, but in a way more relational, more loving than maybe a king or a priest or a prophet. Conceiving of God as Father has helped, for some of us anyway, to personalize our relationship with the Almighty, to make God more approachable and in a way more loving than we might naturally understand a being as infinite and complex as God to be. But it doesn't fit for all of us. The idea of God as a father rings hollow for those whose fathers hit them or abused them. The idea of God as a father rings hollow to those whose fathers walked away rather than be part of their lives. The idea of God as a father rings hollow for those whose fathers, and mothers too for that matter, cast them out like Abraham once they realized they weren't the children they really wanted. Who is God the Father to those whose fathers have been a source of anxiety, suffering, and pain rather than love? God is more than your father. God is the God of the fatherless, the lonely, the outcast, and the oppressed. God is love in a way that goes far beyond any relationship we know, beyond any love that even fathers have for their children. Because no God who loves only as a father loves would ask of their children the things that God asks of us. God's plans for us have nothing to do with our prosperity, our personal security, or even our safety. God's plans for us don't necessarily involve our personal happiness or our wealth or the betterment of our earthly lives. God's plans for us are at once more magnificent and more terrifying than that. He sent Christ to set man against father, daughter against mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. But in my house, as a father, I long for the day where my children don't get into knockdown, down drag out fist fights with each other every 20 minutes. God's goals are different than my goals as a father. God sent Christ not to bring peace to the earth, but a sword. I simply can't imagine a situation in my house growing up where if I went to my father and told him, Hey, Dad, I'm planning to go out this evening, protest against police brutality, against armed, angry riot police, then I'm going to scream at a congressperson, and then gather up a bunch of homeless folks, bring them back home with me, let them sleep in the living room with the heat cranked up while I feed them all the food that is in the fridge. I think my dad would have probably laughed in my face before locking me in my bedroom for the next decade straight. Because these things are wildly unsafe. <laughs> they're dangerous, they're perilous, and a little bit absurd, and they're righteous. Every time I look at the news and I see another photo or video of a police officer brutalizing another young black body, smashing the face of another innocent young person who's protesting the cruelty of our oppressive systems, when I see that, I see the faces of my own children. I can just imagine my fearless, kind-hearted, impossibly loving little kids standing up to the face of something they see as unjust and saying, no more. And in that moment, I am immediately of two minds about things. As a father, I'm abjectly and utterly terrified. I want to do exactly as my father might have in those days. I want to lock them in their rooms until they're in their 40s. Do everything I can to make sure that no harm ever comes to them. My heart breaks at the mere idea of them suffering for whatever reason. I know it needs to be done, but in my heart, look, I got to admit, I don't want it to be them who does it. But as a fellow follower of Christ, when I see their faces in my mind's eye in those situations, I'm impossibly proud, as I am proud of every sibling in Christ who stands up to oppression, who says with Christ that oppression is intolerable, injustice is impermissible, and cruelty cannot stand. Just as I am proud of every sibling in Christ who has embraced the love of a God which is less fearful 
and so much bigger than the love of a mere father. Just as I am proud of everyone who accepts the love of Christ and answers the call to love their neighbor in truth. The call of our Almighty God doesn't bring us back into the safe and secure arms of Father Abraham where we can rest assured that our future is in good hands. Our God calls us out into the wilderness with Mother Hagar where we find the long road towards justice and perhaps a little bit of water along the way. The call of our Almighty God doesn't bring us peace on earth and goodwill towards men. It brings confrontation and dissent. It rents divisions of justice and injustice, setting man against father, daughter against mother, child against parent, one against another, until earth is as it is in heaven, united in the presence of justice rather than the absence of conflict, with goodwill towards all people. The call of our Almighty God does not bring us to places where our lives are secure, where our prosperity is promised and our safety is guaranteed, those who find their lives, their wealth, their prosperity will lose it. But those who lose their lives for Christ's sake will find it. Father's Day is a complicated time for a lot of us. But we didn't come here today to worship a father. Whether we have understood God in those terms or not before, the time has come for us to face the fact that our Creator is no mere Father. No, no, our Creator is something much more majestic, something more magnificent even than that. Our Creator is God, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged, the God who brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry, the God who calls us to witness against and strive against any form of injustice so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. To that one and only God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and glory for ever and ever. Amen.